Hi, everyone. Welcome to our daily live stream. Uh, this is uh, something that we started about two months ago, uh, really to stay in touch during times of social distancing and physical school closures. Uh, obviously, we've been trying to do a lot of other things, but uh, we thought it's, it's also nice to have interesting guests and have interesting conversations about the crisis we're going through and beyond. I do like to remind everyone we are a not-for-profit organization. Uh, we only exist because of philanthropic donations from folks like yourself. Uh, so if you're in a position to do so please think about donating to Khan Academy. I want to give special thanks to several corporations that have stepped up in uh, the recent uh, last several months. Uh, you know, we were already running at a deficit before the crisis and it grew as our server costs grew and we've been trying to accelerate some programs forward. So special thanks to Bank of America, Google.org, AT&T, Fastly, and Novartis. Uh, and now we're going to have a new segment where I'm going to bring in Dan. Hi, Dan, uh, to just make a couple of quick announcements for us. All right, so we're super excited to um, to announce the launch of our Spanish language U.S. site for remote learning, con.co slash sigamos aprendiendo. Uh, the folks, uh, our team will be adding the links to the message boards right now. Um, it's really exciting because not only is it uh, for our U.S. Spanish speaking folks, um, it is also an adaptation of our resources. So we didn't just translate, we actually made sure that we were adapting all of our remote learning resources uh, appropriately. Um, and then another announcement we wanted to share is that there will be no uh, homeroom show tomorrow. Sal will be on Hey There Human with Rain Wilson, better known as Dwight Schrute, on Soul pa Pancake's Instagram channel at noon tomorrow. But we will be back on Thursday for a special homeroom set celebrating the graduating class of 2020. So um, if you know any other uh, graduating seniors this year, please invite them to join homeroom. Sal's gonna be sharing some special messages and the segments will be uh, highlighting all the great work that you all did this past year. So. Thanks, Dan. I'm, I'm mildly entertained and disturbed by some of those graphics that I just saw. <laughs> but, uh, so, so thanks, Dan. And so I'm, I'm super excited for our, our guest today, uh, Superintendent Alberto Carvalho from Miami-Dade. Uh, who, you know, we, we've uh, known each other off and on for, for many years now. Uh, 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 Superintendent Carvalho, thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure, Sal. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Look forward to the conversation and uh, can't wait to see you in cap and gown Thursday. <laughs> My mom will probably be excited and anytime yeah. it looks like I'm getting more educated. So, so uh, maybe a good place to start before, obviously it'll be interesting to talk about how y'all have been navigating the crisis, but you know, what, kind of blew my mind was the first time that we had a chance to really oh. dig in deeply with everything going on at Miami-Dade is, you know, there's a lot of narrative of large urban school districts, you know, t the stereotype is that it can be a little bit dysfunctional, a little bit slow moving. And I think, and you know, I've told this to uh, other people when you're not in the room, something y'all have done at, at Miami-Dade, it, it's, it seems pretty incredible. Tell us kind of the transformation of Miami-Dade and where y'all have gotten with things like graduation rates and, and other measures. It's very interesting we're having that conversation now in the middle of a, uh, a crisis because I'm a crisis superintendent. I started back, back in 2008, 2009 as superintendent uh, at the onset of one of the uh, greatest recessions this nation uh, ever went through. And quite frankly, uh, within that crisis, there was an opportunity. And then we'll go back to how we're finding the opportunity wrapped you know, uh, in, in, in today's crisis. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, when I started as superintendent, uh, this was a district where only 30% of the students uh, were taking advantage of uh, choice programs, particularly advanced academic choice programs. A uh, graduation rate... Uh, well, what is a choice program, just for those of us? Uh, attendance in magnet schools, single, single gender schools, mm -hmm. career academies, anything I but see. a traditional school environment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, graduation rates were at 56% district-wide. But behind that curtain of general performance, there were some high schools where the graduation rate was as low as 35 percent, the shame of our community. We had uh, nine schools under a threat of shutdown by the state of Florida because of performance, because for as long as there was an accountability system, uh, there, uh, these schools had never posted anything uh, higher, better than a D or an F. Um, there were literally uh, high schools in Miami-Dade uh, where uh, zero students were taking advantage of advanced placement classes, IB or Cambridge, uh, and that was reasonably disturbing. And of course, uh, on the national setting, I don't think Miami-Dade was necessarily moving the needle. You, uh, you fast forward, uh, and a decade later, 
uh, 73% of our students are enrolled in non-traditional programs. That means parents and students are making choices about the types of programs, modality of learning, something that actually excites them. If they want robotics, coding, performing, visual arts, uh, cybersecurity, there is something for everyone. A one size fits none in Miami-Dade. Over 1,000 choice programs, 1,000 parental options for kids in Miami-Dade. Uh, secondly, uh, for the second year in a row, we are an A-rated school system in the state of Florida, the highest level of performance. Uh, three years in a row, zero F-rated schools. Uh, graduation rate this year at uh, 90% from 56%. And uh, zero school uh, with a graduation rate below 80%. The school that uh, used to have a graduation rate of 35% is today at 80%. And uh, the most remarkable thing is during that time period, um, we became better. Uh, you know, during times of crisis, uh, we had a chance of reinventing ourselves into a better version of us, discarding a lot of the, the dead wood, slaying a lot of sacred cows that, you know, anchored the status quo uh, really well, uh, reinvented the school system through digital convergence. That's why we were so prepared for our transition to distance learning because we passed a uh, remarkable bond referendum back in 2012 uh, for $1.2 billion, $250 million of which were spent in technology. And that was really revolutionary uh, in Miami-Dade from curating, developing, acquiring uh, applications, uh, content, digital content that's personalized and adaptive uh, to ubiquitous universal Wi-Fi guarantee, expanded bandwidth across the board, and then uh, the device conversation, uh, where uh, not using bond referendums dollars because I don't believe in mortgaging for 30 years an asset whose life uh, span is two and a half to three years, but we've acquired an excess of 300,000 devices. Uh, and that's where we are today, you know, broad winning district, one of the highest performing urban districts uh, in the country with the highest percentage of Cambridge passing rate, AP passing rate. Uh, and when you look at who we are, a minority district, 95% minority, 75% uh, poor, 50% uh, of our student body is immigrant, 80,000 of our kids are English language learners, a lot of people would say can't be done. Uh, but uh, we have shown that the impossible can become the inevitable right here in sunny South Florida. And I want to double click on that before we even get to the present because you know, when I, I remember when I first learned these, you know, the, the, for, for those of you who are listening who are not familiar with data from s public schools and large urban school districts, what uh, Superintendent Carvalho just described is not usual. <laughs> this is this is a major transformation that a lot of people talk about. What in your mind, Superintendent Carvalho, I mean, even from your from a leadership point of view or what other stakeholders are bringing to the table, yeah. what allowed you to do this? Why can't we do this in, in, a, in every city in, in the country or in the world? Or what would have to happen or what should the leaders be doing uh, you know, to make that happen? Yeah, that's a question I'm most asked uh, everywhere I go when I give a speech, when I teach at Harvard. Everybody always asks me that. And, and the answer that I give is really fundamentally based on five simple points. And the conclusion is that it's, this is really not that hard of work. It's no longer a skill set that impairs or, or prevents others from replicating these results. It's really a will set proposition. <laughs> Do you have I the like political will courage? Set. Yeah. Do you have the political courage to actually um, embrace the work and the practice with a degree of abandonment, uh, take risks, and do right by kids? while sometimes irking the adults. Respecting the adults, but sometimes irking the adults. And certainly we've done that here. So the five things, number one, leadership matters. And uh, shortly after I became superintendent, I am, uh, principals are directly accountable to me. And I, I have to tell you that, and I don't say this with pride, uh, that I removed, replaced, demoted, terminated, promoted 85% of all principals in the fourth largest school system in America. And there's a reason for that. Uh, I was looking for data-driven, courageous, instructional leaders who are uh, community-minded and are risk takers themselves, who can navigate complex data systems, can identify gaps before they materialize and develop strategies to address them. And that's the profile of the leader that I want. Uh, secondly, the reason why leadership, school leadership is so important is because in Miami-Dade, and I believe this is a good practice, 
we screen teachers, but principals hire teachers. So the hiring of teachers, you know, the building block of, of public education is done at the school site. So I put a lot of trust in my instructional leaders, my captains, who are principals. Uh, and that is the second critical element, is effective, uh, strategic, data-driven teaching that is differentiated, that utilizes all the assets we have, uh, that, uh, that complements the leadership style of the principals we hired. The third one uh, is, in fact, digital convergence. And for me, this was uh, our way of tackling um, a huge inequity that existed prior to our work here, uh, which, by the way, America came face to face with it during this pandemic crisis, which is uh, digital inequity. The fact that across the country by zip code, people uh, finally became aware uh, of what they already knew, is that there are a lot of digital deserts. And what digital deserts do, uh, to poor kids particularly, is it limits their ability to learn. Their learning is limited uh, in the bell-to-bell -bell time they have in school. Why? They don't have a device at home. They don't have connectivity at home. Uh, so our digital convergence effort, which began in 2012, 2013, empowered us with the ability to actually create a portal of learning for the most fragile kids by giving them a device, personalized content, applications, and connectivity if they need it. And by the way, developing a parent academy to orient parents in assisting their kids from home. Um, that's, number, uh, that's number three. Number four is parental engagement. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I leave it for number four because I can't change the parent as much as I can change the child, but I can f influence the parent. And uh, our launch of the Parent Academy as a college for parents, number one, to help parents help their own kids navigate uh, uh, schooling. Second, empower parents uh, with skill sets to get them a job in our own school mm -hmm. system, in our technical colleges. And thirdly, empower mm -hmm. parents in an immigrant community uh, to be civic-minded, know their rights, know the laws, take advantage of the protections that are afforded them. Uh, but the real reason for the Parent Academy, and this hurts the feelings of some educators out there in America, is I want to make parents dangerous. You know, just like the law of economics, supply and demand, you know, uh, we all know communities that are demand-sided in terms of their parents, others are supply-sided. Demand-sided communities, it's those communities, uh, reasonably affluent, parents know exactly where the best school, the best program, the best principal, the best teacher, and they demand that their kid be in it. And then you have certain communities where parents, unfortunately, don't really know what to ask for. Uh, they supply with their children with a hope and prayer and wish that you do something right by them. So part of my theory of action here is I want to feel pressure from communities that have not necessarily expressed their discontent sometimes with what happens with their children in school. That's empowering parents. And then the last element is effective, targeted, strategic uh, human capital development, professional development, really retooling, reskilling the workforce that we have. Look, you cannot go out there and, and trade your army. By the way, my army is fantastic. So it's hiring the right people, but it's also accelerating the pace that you transition the army of uh, employees you have, particularly teachers and support staff, into a new way of thinking, a new way of teaching, a new way of supporting, a new way of using data, a new way of using technology. You do those five, and I guarantee you, any school system, rural, urban, small, large, will prosper. No, those are great, and and I'm getting a lot of questions uh, showing up on YouTube and Facebook. Before I go into that, I am I actually have a leadership question, and also before we talk about the COVID crisis, you, you know, you, you talk about those five things, and they make a ton of sense. But the I, and I love your phrase, the the will set, the willpower to do it. You know, to go in as a new superintendent and to you know make some of these changes, some of them quite dramatic. It's easier said than done. Yeah, you know, I, I'm curious from at a personal level, what went through your head? Is there sometimes where you say, "Hey, may, Alberto, maybe I'm 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 the wrong one. Maybe I shouldn't rock the boat too much. Uh, maybe I should just kind of play nice." I mean, how, how do you? Because I, I weigh those things all the time. Sometimes I feel conviction about something, but yeah. I'm the only person who believes it. I'm like, maybe I should just back off a little bit. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you a, a funny so story, Sal. Number one, I do believe in working at the edge of the abyss because if you if you don't know how 
how deep the gap where our kids live is. Uh, and you don't know until you get really close to it. And you don't get really close to it unless you take immense risks. So when I talk about abandonment, yeah, I'm talking about abandonment for the, for the position that I hold. Uh, I, I risk the position. I try very hard, I tell this to people all the time, to get fired. And it is in that precious moment where you flirt with termination that something big happens for the district. If it's big enough for you to make a personal bet in, trust me, uh, things will happen. And that happened, tr uh, quite frankly, within two weeks of being appointed superintendent. goes directly to your question. Look, remember the nine schools that were going to be shut down by the state of Florida for performance? And by the way, these were all black and brown schools in high poverty areas. If you shut down the school for performance, the only thing that will be on that street will be a liquor store, a pawn a shop, maybe a church. And the beacon of hope and opportunity for that community is extinguished. I was not going to do that. Okay, there was a greater chance of the crown of Spain of reclaiming Florida than me giving up on these schools. So I brought the nine principles of the schools one at a time to have a conversation with me. And uh, I had a conversation with them, asked them all the questions. They had been there for a long period of time. And the one question they all across the board failed was when I asked them, why don't you have a single AP class, AP literature, AP physics, chemistry, give me something, AP Spanish. And across the board, the answer was, you know, I'd love to, but I don't have kids for that. At that point, I didn't have a job for them. I fired nine principals. Well, nobody ha had told me that uh, over the previous 90 years, the school system had not fired nine principals. And I remember the board chair at that time taking me aside and said, and saying to me two weeks in, you know, I regret voting for you as superintendent. You fired my friends. Um, now it burned, uh, it was rough, but I survived. And once you go through one of those experiences, you build resiliency. When you time that with a window of opportunity, and by the way, those don't just come once in a lifetime, they happen, they happen cyclically. We have one happening right now, a window of opportunity then you can get really crazy good things done. Uh, not devoid of threat or challenge, but if you're grounded in that which is right, then you take on the sacred cows, you take on the political establishment, and you force through that which you know will actually pay off for kids. Do I worry sometimes? Uh, I myself, not as much. Uh, sometimes my team does. Sometimes my wife may a bit, uh, but um, I feel the community is on our side. We're very transparent. I tell the story all the time. Um, the media, believe it or not, 12 years in, I don't complain about the media, the print media, TV media, uh, because uh, they recognize that uh, we, we leave it all out there. So, yeah, there are some tough times, uh, but there are enough people in this community who are awake and support the work and provide a cover for the work to continue. That's super powerful. Just you know, do what's right and the chips fall where they do, uh, even for yourself versus you know, preserving a job or title or whatever is expedient. I think it's a, a very powerful you know, notion. You know, a lot of folks out there do what I do that uh, never, tr never really risk that much out of fear of pushing the envelope too far. And you know what happens? They end up losing the job because the performance never increases. And um, so at least, you know, lose your job doing something big, bold, and right that actually moves the needle because you have greater chances of actually keeping your job if the needle moves because people pay attention. Uh, so, you know, that to me, it's, it, it's my theory of action and it, it's worked. Um, I recommend it strongly to those who, you know, who don't mind, uh, you know, feeling the pressure that comes with the territory, but uh, it's worked for us. That's that's fascinating. So uh, I'm gonna go into some of these questions and really get more to the present. You know, uh, Susana Garcia Dominguez on YouTube is asking, "Greetings, uh, Superintendent Carvalho. What are your takeaways from this pandemic crisis?" From uh, we have uh, another one from I just saw it just disappeared where a student was asking about just how you uh, navigating the crisis. So yeah, play play it out for us. How, you know, how did this all evolve in Miami over the last uh, I guess two and a half months when it started to become clear that we might have to have to close? Yeah. So you, you may find this incredible, but uh, we did not wait on the federal government or, or the state of Florida to tell us to provide us directives on how to prepare for what was inevitable. Uh, actually, I remember us back in January, simultaneously, we were digesting 
uh, headlines out of China, and I had just watched a series on Netflix dealing with uh, a pandemic, and uh, and I connected the two. A week later, uh, coronavirus is on my leadership uh, agenda to be discussed with my cabinet,、uh, and a few weeks later, we were readying a survey for parents to determine. What the critical technology needs were at home. Why? Because we put on the board the worst-case scenario to solve for, and that worst-case scenario is all schools going to shut down, 355,000 K-12 kids going to be home, in addition to 40,000 adult learners, 48,000 employees will be home. What are you going to do? What's our solution for that? So we bet on the worst-case scenario. And when was this? Was this in in February or January? You were January, you were you were having this conversation in January. No one was talking about school closures back no, in January. No, no,、wow. we we began a contingency plan in January, February. We began to actually write the plan. By before two weeks before the shutdown, we had the first version of our instructional continuity plan, which was followed by an ICP 2.0, a much more evolved with. Student and teacher accountability. Look, we shut down schools with、uh, we shut down schools with、uh, an LOU, a negotiated agreement with the teachers' union,、uh, agreeing to accountability. You know, number of hours uh, uh, that uh, we're expecting in terms of responsiveness to students and connectivity and connection. The same thing, attendance for students.、Uh, we didn't have to do this on the back end. Before we shut down schools, we had already developed. Uh, webinars for teachers. We had already put 100% of our teachers、uh, through professional development, which was not difficult because they were already using the same applications, the same devices in the classroom that now、uh, the kids and the teachers themselves were using at home. The geography changed, but nothing else did.、Uh, the survey results empowered us with the ability to actually know exactly who needed a device, who needed a hotspot. So when we began the distribution. 119,000 devices hit the hands of kids quickly. 11,000 hotspots. 100% connectivity in Miami-Dade. And by the way, and this is still right now, average daily attendance. Hold on, America. 91 to 92%. That's about one to two percent、uh, away from a typical day last year around this time,、um, because we prepared. We were not waiting on the federal government to say it's time to go now. We anticipated worst-case scenario, and we prepared for it, hoping for the best. And that's exactly what we're doing right now, by the way, for the reopening.、Um, come August 20,、uh, we are, you know, these days it's less, less about strategic planning. It's more about active strategic thinking that is nimble, that is swift, that can pivot. On the basis of environmental changes in our communities, and I think leadership today is having a number of contingency plans ready to jump to, depending on conditions as they emerge between now and the reopening of schools. However, that happens in August,、uh, and that's exactly what we're doing.、Uh, we were not waiting from、uh, from the landlord to tell us when to rearrange the furniture at our level.、Uh, we got ready for that. And there's several things. I mean, we could we could double click on a lot of what you just said, but I'm curious how you were able to so quickly. I mean, it sounds like one of your advantages you you saw it coming and you planned ahead, but you know, just the devices that you mentioned, a hundred something thousand devices, a large chunk of the students. I mean, it sounds like you've kind of closed the digital divide in your community, somewhat. You know, not overnight, but over a few weeks. How, how did you pull? How, how did you pull that off?、Uh, data, data, data. You know,、uh, data is part of our DNA. is our north star.、Uh, we have an equity mindset. We knew exactly where the opportunity gaps were for kids, and we planned、uh, to address it in a very strategic, methodical,、uh, procedural way. And、uh, and you're right.、Uh, as far as the data that we manage daily, and every single day at 9 a.m., I get the reports from my、uh, senior team. Before we start today,、uh, via Zoom、uh, conversation, that looks at system-wide performance, but then looks at disaggregated data for the lowest 25% of students in terms of reading proficiency, for English language learners, for students with disabilities,、uh, 
uh, for the immigrant child. Um, I get all of those reports in addition to attendance for every one of these groups. So we can very, very quickly address uh, the pockets of low performance or the outliers. I mean, there was a point where we had students who were unaccounted for. Guess what? Uh, we used wellness checks, even our own police department, with a knock on the door, a social worker, a device in a bag uh, with easy instructions. Um, we leverage the fact that we continue to feed kids. And again, buckle your seat belt once again. Uh, as of today, we fed 2.9 million meals out of 50 centers. We do it twice a week for every single day, for every single kid, no questions asked, that comes to our schools. But in addition to that, because we know that some kids live in really harsh conditions, facing uh, food insecurity in their zip codes, we embraced and embarked on this community feeding project, not using taxpayers' money, but through our foundation, capturing money, then putting small restaurants to work to prepare meals to distribute to the zip codes where we had the highest poverty overlaid over this grid that demonstrated the largest concentration of poor kids. So uh, have we have we filled or, or narrowed some of the gaps? In some cases, we obliterated the gap. Uh, in many cases, it's work in progress, but uh, it's what we're doing now, quite frankly, as we wrap up this school year and the end of next school year that I'm excited. And uh, if we have a chance, I'd like to talk about it. Yeah, no, we got a, a bunch of questions there from YouTube. Charlotte, sometimes, what is the plan for next school year? Will it only be digital or will it be mixed learning? Kim Darling from YouTube, do you anticipate going back to school? Or, or Yeah, so, so speak to that. How, what yeah. are the contingency plans you all are thinking of? So number one, I have absolute expectation. I'm the eternal optimist. Kids will go back to schooling. Now, going back to school and when, that's a function. Since I'm a science-driven guy, you know, my... my <laughs> My degree is in, in, in biomedical sciences with a minor in physics. I, I have no choice, it's in my DNA, to decode science and use it to inform the practice. So what I can tell you right now is uh, what we're doing uh, really uh, in, a, in a very proud and deliberate way is dealing with America will experience very soon, which is the largest precedent-setting historic academic regression, the likes of which the nation has never seen. And by the way, it's going to impact disproportionately the kids who are always at the bottom to begin with. These are, by the way, the kids who before the crisis were already in crisis, which is interesting, right? There were a lot of kids amongst us before COVID-19 crisis, they were already experiencing a multifaceted crisis uh, on a daily basis. So for us, this is the educational opportunity hidden in this health crisis. And it, uh, it begins with two summer sessions. And by the way, all of our budget's gonna be hit hard, but uh, this is my priority uh, budget before my board. Two summer sessions, the very first one is a virtual session targeting uh, students already identified on the basis of performance, on the basis of fragility, on the basis of their uh, lackluster connection during distance learning on the basis of formative assessment data. The second summer session may be virtual or should conditions improve significantly, we may bring students into schools in small groups, small ratios for very individualized attention by teachers, credit recovery, students with disabilities, immigrant students and the like. Then we already budgeted for and planned for uh, the next school year to start two weeks earlier for 25% of our student population. That's 46,000 students opening all schools taught by uh, selected teachers who have a high record of uh, success uh, with these minority populations, with these struggling students. Next, virtual mentors and tutors for every single kid. Next, for 25 schools, that have the greatest percentage of these fragile children, one hour added at the end of the day for additional opportunity to catch up. What I'm describing here is the opportunity for us is to academically stabilize these kids who historically have fallen behind by the end of the 2020-2021 school year. Now, what will school look like uh, next year? Guess what, America? 
since distance learning became a reality across all 50, 50 states, parents have had a unique opportunity uh, to have a front row seat and observe the whole show. They have been monitoring what's happening in their kids' education. They have made judgments, evaluated the experience. They have determined how responsive the teacher was or wasn't. They know the level of engagement of their own children. And I think parents, as a result of this, are not going to give up that knowledge. So that's why this new normal everybody keeps talking about, it's real. Parents will be more demanding, and I think they'll be more demanding in terms of expectations for their children. But now that they know that it is possible, my prediction is, and this is what we're planning for in Miami-Dade, again, one size fits none, is a very flexible opportunity to schedule students and teach students on the basis of individual student modality, flexibility and demand on a parent's life, uh, the logistics that will condition our actions, social distancing, measuring of temperature, kids going into schools, having to reconfigure schools the way, for example, you feed, probably you're not going to be able to congregate kids in a cafeteria. So food will be distributed to each classroom, like Uber Eats to the classroom. Uh, unidirectional uh, hallways uh, to reduce contact. Cyclical, mandatory washing of hands. Much stronger systems for illness detection and reporting. But what I'm excited about, quite frankly, is the fact that we will see, in my opinion, an explosion of hybrid and blended learning models. And I'll just give you an example, three examples. Little Johnny, because of parental circumstances or the fact that he is a highly social being, wants to be in school 100% of the time. Our school system ought to be able to deliver that. Mary, on the other hand, may say, you know what? My parents, one parent, is at home part of the time, and I'd like to be home part of the time. So I would like to be on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at home, on Tuesdays and Thursdays actually at school. We can do that too. Why not? Then there may be yet another child who, for a whole host of reasons, may say, I actually thrive in this environment and I want to make school visitations. I want to take advantage of some of the programs, athletics, etc. But I feel safer, at least for uh, a, the beginning of the year, based on parental concerns, uh, staying home and learning from a distance. What I just described is sort of a spectrum of opportunity that is choice driven that identifies the needs of parents and students and tries to match them with individualized learning pathways that are suited and suitable for each kid. And I think that's what's going to explode. It's sort of the new dimension of choice in America. That's super powerful because if you take it one intellectual step from there, that means that even the physical experiences will have to support the virtual and that to some degree you're not necessarily bound to one physical location anymore in theory. That is uh, absolutely right. And, and look, uh, I'm already writing letters and uh, advocating. Based on the experience we've had, I think state houses and the federal government needs to rethink a number of things. Number one, how education is funded. I mean, I think we're proving that uh, having everybody start at the same time, end at the same time for the exact same number of minutes every single day in the same place uh, doesn't work anymore. So we need to liberalize funding methodology for public education across the country so that mandated seat time is not a mandatory feature in, uh, in student funding. Secondly, uh, the how, when, how, uh, by, by whom and how often something is taught and what is taught needs to be looked at as well. And, and I think that what we have learned under duress, right, in the rush, can now over the summer and in months to come be analyzed and let's use some of the learnings from this experience to actually enhance the student experience moving forward. And I think that's reasonably powerful. Wow. Well, you know, Superintendent Carvalho, I could talk to you for a few more hours. I actually want to take notes uh, on a lot of this because what you're doing, I mean, at a very large scale with a, a complex school district, and I, there's a lot more hows, there's a lot of questions. How are you able to pull this off? You know, what you're saying makes so much intellectual sense, but, you know, the time frames and obviously the dollars, where are you getting the resources to do it? 
uh, you know, I guess you're, you're willing to, to, to stake your job on a lot of things. We talked about that. So that's the will. I mean, I, I actually just to answer if you, if you have a couple more minutes, I'd love, you know, uh, how, how are you able to do this? How are you able to do these programs? You know, where are you finding the resources? When you, you talk yeah. to a lot of places are like, oh, we don't have an, an extra penny. We're already, you know, over our heads in terms of budget. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think real, number one, let's recognize that the, the, the fiscal shock that our nation is about to experience the fiscal shock that uh, public education systems across America are about to face uh, is going to be a daunting one. Uh, but we've been there before, probably not to this degree. So, you know, I, I don't want to give uh, Tallahassee, in, in my case, or, or Washington, D.C., uh, a pass. Uh, during the last economic recession, um, under stimulus packages back then, over $115 billion were appropriated to stabilize uh, educational opportunities across the country. So far, under the CARES Act, uh, the current uh, federal stimulus packages, only $16 billion have been earmarked. And trust me, by all accounts, you know, and uh, we read Moody's Analytics uh, as often as we possibly can. The prediction is that what's coming is a more powerful, longer lasting economic recession uh, than the Great Recession of 2008-9. So the federal government needs to do quite a bit more. At the same time, I'm one who believes that, uh, uh, that reductions across the board uh, don't require leadership. So even during tough times, you ought to prioritize that which is most important. And that's where we start. We follow something we branded here in Miami, which is values-based, zero-based budgeting. Each year, each year starts at zero with the highest priorities being funded first, everything else is secondary. And that's exactly what we're doing. Um, we are preparing uh, for, uh, for this fiscal shock. So we turned off the, you know, the, uh, the spending um, rivers long ago. Uh, Non-essential hiring stopped, procurement stopped, renegotiation of private sector contracts at a discount, 10% minimally, uh, because whatever, cost, whatever the cost was for something, a service or a good, uh, three months ago, it's not the same today. You know, as a nation, we went from 3% unemployment to over 20% in six weeks. Everything has changed, which means we need to change. So we will face the fiscal crisis. Uh, we have and have amassed reasonable reserves. Uh, we passed two bond referenda that have secured teacher salaries uh, in a very significant way. We boosted our teacher salaries last year anywhere from 14 to 23% uh, and wow. improved security. And that's not uh, in danger because the funding stream for that is property uh, tax-based, not state revenue. So that's going to remain stable. Our investment in technology is going to remain stable. Our upkeep of our schools is going to remain stable because we saw the need to help ourselves. Uh, operations, yes, we will depend on state and federal revenues and we're working those as well. But there's always an opportunity to prioritize that which is important in a budget. Uh, we don't believe in 5% across the board, 10% across the board. In fact, during times of recession, it is customary for us to actually augment funding for certain critical priorities, like what we're doing for the fragile student population, rather than shying away from it. Obviously, other areas will have to be cut, but those are judgment calls on a basis of priorities. And, uh, and that's what leaders right now in America should be doing. You know, what's most impor important? What are the priorities? What are the gaps that, if you don't address them right now, will grow dramatically between now and August of 2020, making it more expensive uh, for you to engage in the remediation, which I don't believe in remediation. I believe in accelerating towards every child's potential. But those are the considerations, and that's how we're doing it. We're navigating the same waters, but we, we have a different cell, a different rudder, and we're reading the stars in different ways. Wow. Well, that's super inspiring. And, uh, you know, I think as we go through tough times, whether it's in a school system, you're a superintendent out there, or you're just a leader in anything, I think there's there's been a lot of really powerful takeaways. So so thank you so much, Superintendent Carvalho. I hope we can continue this conversation, uh, especially over the next few months. I, I would love to learn how all of this evolves. And I think you're really on the, the cutting edge of thinking through how this is going to play out. Thank you so much. So I really appreciate it. And you've been a terrific partner. Uh, let's continue to do what we do. Uh, not only... Uh, uh, with Khan Academy, but with the College Board, uh, the Council of Great City Schools. And uh, to all the educators out there, listen, 
Uh, schooling will resume, and it is important for us to be a steady stream of normalcy uh, for, for kids, uh, not only intellectually, academically, but also socially and emotionally. And if you cannot do it face-to-face, -face, there are means by which today, using technology, you can do it from a distance, and that's what we've been doing. So good luck to all of you, and uh, talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, well, thank you everyone for joining. Hopefully uh, you're as inspired as I was uh, by talking to Superintendent Carvalho. I think not just uh, lessons on where we're going on the education front, but uh, frankly, leadership lessons I thought were, were pretty profound. Uh, so thank you so much. And as Dan mentioned, we're not going to be there here tomorrow. I'm going to uh, I'm a bit, I've obviously been a big office fan, so I'm excited to meet uh, Rain Wilson, or also known as Dwight Schrude, uh, tomorrow. So that should be entertaining. And then we'll resume uh, back up, I think, on Thursday. Uh, but either way, uh, everyone have a good evening, and I'll, I'll see you one way or the other tomorrow. <laughs>